All right, well, I figured I'd um, resurrect the draft science series. Um, his pyro apparently wants to talk some more of this quantum mechanics stuff. And so he always made another three or four minute video, and I, there's probably no point in playing it and responding to the pieces of it and just go with the general, um, I don't know, contentions being made that I think are a distortion of what the facts are. So let's, let's go through this quantum thing one more time. Um, quantum mechanics, okay, the idea that there's parts aren't indivisible to a certain point. There is a real atom somewhere that you can't break apart, and that's basically the quantum. Um, and, and it's also a, a concession to the practical fact that we can't do certain kinds of experiments. We can't do certain kinds of things because of the limitations, that we can't create these smaller pieces of energy, we can't throw them at other things, we can't see them. All right, so I'll give you the metaphor of, let's say, um, let's say there's a, a just a tennis ball in a tennis court or something, you, and it's completely dark, and you have to detect where the tennis ball is on the tennis court. Um, now, the only thing you can do is find some way to throw something into space and try to say, okay, well, if I throw something into space and it doesn't land where it's supposed to when I throw it, then obviously it interacted with something and it must be the tennis ball. And that's kind of the effect. So the idea is, is what we're basically trying to do when we detect particles, these subatomic particles, is, is we lob another tennis ball into the air and hope that the higher speed tennis ball will hit it change its trajectory, interfere with it in some way that we can detect uh, without distorting its own um, destiny too much. And that's all it really is. It's an interference interaction. And so quantum math is just sort of a concession to the fact that when we are trying to do experiments, um, either model them or experimentally, we have to concede to the fact that we can't find out exactly where something is in a specific moment of time. And so as I've described it, it's basically error math. I mean, it puts into the equation ahead of time what the probable errors are going to be in locating things, in exactly the explicit um, um, determination of uh, observations, okay? So the observations, the things that we put into the equations that define, you know, the variables, we're conceding that those variables, those numbers we're putting into the equation are fudgy, okay? They're not accurate. <clears throat> and what quantum mechanics attempts to do is to keep track of all the inaccuracies, okay, the probabilities, and to put that into the end result. And so that way it's, it, it's, it, it makes up for the difference. It's almost like doing the math 500 times um, the equation uh, when you have a known error rate and then taking the final result <coughs> of that 500, the average answer, and saying, yes, well, that's the probable answer because that's the that's that's what the laws of averages dictate that that's probably the right answer because you ran the experiment a thousand times the equation and so you've you've weeded out the the um, the uh, artifacts the mistakes the nonsense the noise you've taken the noise out of the signal all right so that's basically what that's quantum stuff that's quantum mechanics this two slit experiments isn't quantum mechanics it has quant it involves quantum mechanics because it involves us detecting particles but it really isn't quantum mechanics it's just an experiment that creates a phenomenon and so pyro's saying things like well the particle is interfering with itself and that's not what's that's not even the that's not even an accurate description of the illusion the illusion that's being created is is that we shoot these these particles one at a time towards these two slits and then we detect which slit the particle goes through and then we have a target and we see where the particle ends up all right so when we have we have detectors at the slits and then we have a detector at the the end product and and the phenomenon that's happening is is when the detectors at the slits are on the particles are not behaving like particles anymore. Now they're behaving as if the entire stream of particles that might, that might be shot over a period of three days, 
like that entire stream was a wave of particles that hit the two slits at the same moment in time and and propelled itself through the experiment to the target. So what's happening is the p particle isn't interfering with itself, it's interfering with yesterday's particle. Yesterday's particle somehow has created a, f a space in front of that particle that is dictating its path. And that's the phenomenon that's taking place. The particle is not interfering with itself. It is interfering with the whole collection of particles that predated it, okay, that, that, that journeyed before it. And so somehow a stream of particles that may have been shot over a three-day period is somehow behaving as if it was one continuous wave front made up of multi-particles. All right? I mean, all waves, as we see them in the real world, like in a, in, a, in a puddle where you poke your finger in and you see the waves shoot out, those waves are made up of a whole mass of matter and energy, not a whole mass of individual particles. They, it, is not, it is not one particle turning into a wave. And, and just as in this experiment, each particle itself is not turning into a wave. No, each particle is behaving as if it was part of a wave. It is landing where it would land if it had reached the two slits with a whole bunch of other particles and shot through it at the same time. And so that's the bizarre phenomenon. And so just to be clear here, I mean, this experiment is really, really you know, on the, on the very edge of our um, capacity, our technology. So remember that we're de trying to detect a particle where we don't have anything we can throw at it to detect it. Okay, there's no light bouncing off of a photon. All right, so when we try to detect one in movement, we're going to screw it up a lot. All right, we don't have a low enough energy thing to throw at a photon that isn't going to substantially interfere with it. So it's not even like lobbing a tennis ball at a 70 mile an hour tennis ball and saying, well, hopefully the, the little tiny bit of energy I've imp imparted on the moving particle isn't going to mess it up too much. No, we're more like taking a car going, you know, 70 miles an hour and smashing into it with a car going 30 miles an hour. Um, so we're, we're, you know, this is not a clean experiment. It's an experiment full of fudge and, and nuances of, of, of stuff we can't control, of, of systems we can't fully ob understand or observe. And so to draw any conclusions here is just silly. I mean, obviously, if we turn the detectors off at the slit and, we have the, and, and the, the, the target demonstrates the expectation, the old school physics expectation, that each individual photon is an individual photon and it will land where it's supposed to, not as a wave, but as an individual photon. And then we turn the detectors on and all of a sudden everything changes and now the photon behaves entirely different. I don't think it's idiotic to assume that the detectors are screwing with the photons or the electrons or the bowling balls. Because most physicists will tell you that whatever applies to one should apply to these other um, uh, entities. Uh, it, you know, anything with mass and energy, um, generally speaking, should behave the same. And the reason why we're just not observing what we expect to observe, I would contend, is merely because the, the experiment is just too difficult. All right, there's not a, what we're attempting to do is beyond our capacity. And so we end up with an experiment that has so much error in it um, that we get results that we can't describe or define or explain because we don't understand the nuance of these particles. So let's also understand the particles themselves. They're not just a ball of stuff, okay? They're a ball of stuff that has a frequency and a wavelength which means that the particle must be doing something. So there's lots of ways to, to, to model wavelength and frequency. I mean, you could just use a spiral like a spring, okay? So you know if you have a spring that has really tight coils and a spring that has very long coils, all right? And it, and it can be made, you know, and, and that will determine how much energy is in the particle is how tightly wound those coils are. 
um, theory, you know, just as a model. So the tighter it is, the more energy the particle has, the, the longer the spring, the weaker, the, the less strength the particle has. And, and so that's a whole nuance that the, each one of these, these photons or these electrons or all the rest of the stuff has. It has a component of frequency that defines how much um, velocity it has or how much mass it has, um, how much energy it has. And so that has part of this equation is, is then when we try to throw this other springed particle at it with another frequency, it's just, it seems quite probable that we're going to have a lot of tangled springs in the end, and the results we get should probably be a little broken. Um, so anyway, I just, I mean, I'm not a physicist, and, um, you know, I, I can't argue because I've, I haven't seen the experiment. I mean, they should have a YouTube video of them doing the experiment and show us what the detectors are made of and how exactly they're doing this detecting. But unfortunately, you don't get those explanations anywhere. Um, because I think if we want to find the, f the, f the w what's causing the phenomenon, I think all it takes is analyzing the experiment. Because I think the phenomenon is being created by.